the light of Christ's redeeming work, nothing and no one can be flatly taken at face value. For those with eyes to see, all fleshly circumstances are sheets thrown over the ghostly movements of God's Spirit, and the fabric of every relationship a sail to carry us beyond ourselves and into a new way of living in our bodies. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, what makes a work of art great? Although we will have no shortage of theories, perhaps because we'll have no shortage of theories, that's not a question we're likely to be able to answer today or ever. Perhaps we could start at the other end. What makes a work of art terrible? Or better yet, what is it that, say, a painting or a sculpture depends on at the most basic level for us even to discuss its relative merits as art? Well, first and foremost, it needs to be visible. Invisible art rarely wins even the Turner Prize, or so you might think. Were it not for the fact that the most viewed piece of art in existence, whose greatness might be debated, but whose popularity simply cannot be, itself gives the lie to the notion that art needs first of all. And its story points to the possibility that it, perhaps, might have much more to do with what is hidden from sight. The piece I'm talking about, of course, as many of you already know, is the most visited, but still the most reproduced world. That wasn't always the case. In fact, there was a time when it was so far from being the focus of our collective gaze that on a summer's morning in 1911, the Italian house painter Vincenzo Perugia could stroll into the Louvre, remove the painting from its frame, put it under his coat, and walk out. And not only did no one notice him taking it, but no one noticed that it had been taken until more than 24 hours came to find a quiet corridor to sketch her portrait, only to discover instead the empty space where it had hung. In the two years it took to find the Mona Lisa smiling up from the bottom of a trunk in Perugia's lodgings, that smile became the world's most copied image, a title it has yet to relinquish. But more tellingly, within days of its disappearance, a queue had formed of visitors to the Louvre clamoring to see the imageless who remained not just throughout those two years, but since after the painting was returned. It is still hard to see the Mona Lisa, not because it's absent, but because of the surrounding presence of tourists. As some have heard me say in another context, has suggested that the peculiar process by which a work of art can be more fascinating by being absent than it ever was by being present is in fact a clue to what art is always doing. He argues that what is important about art is what it conceals, what lies behind it rather than what it portrays on or by its surfaces. And that the events that now famous work of art to allow a focused game it in fact revealed the true meaning of artistic work in the first place. Whether you agree with him or not, what he says strikes an interesting note on this day in the church's calendar. We follow the practice the church has employed in one form or another since at least the Middle Ages and veil crosses, statues and images from now until the great unveiling of Easter. Now, there are many reasons offered for this admittedly peculiar. Some say it stems from our gospel, in which our Lord had the view of those who wanted to stone him because his time. Others link that cloaking from sight with its echoes in Christ's appearances and disappearances after the resurrection and his ascension to remind us that the, what the unique moment of the cross and the descent and lifting up that is the whole fabric of the incarnation both conceals and reveals 
is the interpenetration in the divine son of the eternal dimension and the temporal human realm and the consequent transcending of time and space, the transcending of mere flesh. Still others see in our Passion Tide Pauls a deliberate reference to our epistle and lesson or to the books of Hebrews and Exodus in general and the presence of these very ideas in the crucial imagery of tabernacle and temple veils, especially given the old German Passion Tide practice of the Hungertuch, the veiling of the entire altar between now and the Passion narrative of the Wednesday of Holy Week in which by the rending of Christ's flesh, the veil now, none of these allusions are and neither is there any reason not to hold them all as part of the significance of this deliberately mysterious tradition. Quite the contrary. There is perhaps something even more basic at work here that not only reflects our lessons and prepares us to see more clearly into the mysteries of hope, something of what it is we're about here every week in our Lenten and indeed lifelong call to to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Christ. Truth be told, the whole notion of veiling is nor as simple as it appears, rather something which we do all the time, and in which we express and grapple with an important paradox in much the same way as we might well do in creating and admiring works of art. Although they're arguably not so prevalent as they have been, we're that cover our eyes or our heads, wimples. And we take for granted the idea of covering cloths or statues in stately gardens for a season in winter. Whilst here, in a chapel like ours, veils and coverings are significantly always in regard to the body. Those covering the chalice and pattern or the tabernacle or occasionally the coffin and its pall at funerals, or the catafalque, or regularly the human humoral veil at benediction. So what is it precisely that all these veilings have in common? And why in Passion Tide do we apparently go over the top with putting cloths over the top of things? Perhaps part of the answer was well expressed by the conceptual artists Christo and Jean-Claude, also accused of going somewhat over the top, when they took it upon themselves to wrap the rice tag and the pond nerf and even a number of islands in fabric. Feats which, not very surprisingly, provoked the question, why? Their response was that they wanted to new ways of seeing familiar landscapes called this process revelation through concealment. It would be hard to come up with a more concise definition than that for what's going various veilings. Because what is veiled in any context is not veiled never to be seen. That is not at all the nature of hiding. If you don't wish something to be seen ever again, you certainly don't hide it. You destroy it. If Vincenzo Perugia had really wanted the Mona Lisa smile to disappear, he could easily have achieved that by defacing it. But the fact that it was not only found intact but found beneath several postcard reproductions of itself, points to some other motive or intention in its concealment. Things are veiled in order to be seen, just seen in a new light. No longer the woman you knew, but a bride or a bride of Christ. Ensure they're seen in the right context and in the right way. That is why public veiling has been so prolific, a desire to control, for better or worse, not what is seen, but how it is seen. Just as burying treasure or hiding gifts beneath wrapping is not about those precious things never seeing the light of day. It's about that which is treasured not being stolen or taken for granted, but rather received as gift. Veiling the cross in the very fortnight that concerns itself most intensely with the cross, has that same function. Just as the veiled layers of temple and tabernacle had, not to keep the people away from what is most vital, but precisely to focus them and their attention on just how vital it is. 
And there is nothing more vital, more central for us than the passion and resurrection of Christ. It is it is our entry into the Holy of Holies in the Incarnation's tent of meeting. So if someone were setting out to really make clear its centrality and importance, you might argue, they might even consider only bringing out the cross in the Passion Tide, making a real event focus the collective gaze of Israel on the Holy of Holies and the high priest's entry beyond the veil. But that would be problematic and misleading for Christians. Because if something truly is vital, it ought to be permanently and obviously central. It ought to overshadow. And the cross has always been not just the way, but the daily way on in faith. Something for us and orient our every interaction around. So in order to prevent the daily presence of the cross from doing what they and removing a thing from sight by veiling it in familiarity, we adopt the deliberately strange annual practice of revealing the cross by concealment. And in so doing, we also make use of the other central aspect of all veiling. The right way, but of it being revealed to cover anything is to move it out of the static realm of object and position and into the dynamic realm of relationship and time. To set in motion a timer whose loud ticking reminds us continually of something that is not yet fully present, not entirely absent. What is an object covered with a cloth of question and answer, a game of time quite different from the one you would have found yourself in where everything visible at first glance. Now you know something you do not yet see, but which can be seen now. It's a matter of time. And this is of supreme importance to us, who know from Scripture that the sign is the marker of the passage of time, because if we are to see the cross and the passion aright, and in their light see all things as they truly are, then we cannot allow ourselves to view the passion as merely an event or the cross as merely an object. We must recognize that what we are being invited to enter through them itself. It is, in other words, an eternal relationship. The cross represents the eternal relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit in the person of Jesus, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And as such, it is both the veil of that invisible reality and the tearing of that veil, that which covers and reveals at one and the same time, and which draws us forward. He keeps driving at in his conflicts with the Jews. To see me for what I am, you must not see me, but see the Father who sent me. I seek not mine own glory. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me. See me for what I am. Then in so doing, you are seeing the one no one has seen but me. Mysteries which we call holy. On Darian Leader's intuition about the work of art, Ponte's insight that to truly live, our flesh must, like our art, become transparent. This is the thing of the cross, the recognition that everything in creation, even our most sacred objects, even the incarnate word is a veil waiting to be lifted up, something which points to the presence of that which is beyond it, even as it partly hides it from view, something whose purpose is to the endless process of giving, which we call the cross, relationship of which it too was made. As you can tell, it's a much easier notion to act out than to describe. And so we do, each week in our Eucharist, through Passion Tide to Easter. But insofar as we can grasp what is being acted out, 
and participate more fully in it, we find ourselves not just seeing the familiar in new ways, as Lent promised to teach us, but freed in the season of things given up from the fear being taken from our sight, freed by something of greater value beyond it, and rediscovered time, transformed and newly transparent as gift, as a sacrament of the love that it makes visible. Christ's redeeming work, nothing and no one can flatly be taken at face value. For those with eyes to see, all fleshly circumstances are sheets to be thrown over the ghostly movements of God's Spirit, the fabric of every relationship a sail to carry us beyond ourselves into a new way of living in our bodies, into the infinite life of love itself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.